And hopefully, hopefully some of the um, images and things that Ernest is going to talk about will make you feel a little bit better about coming out. Okay. Well, good morning and welcome on this chilly, wet spring morning. It is spring, things are happening. There's a lot of what we'll talk about. In fact, I will talk more about spring than I will other things. By the way, I'm Ernest Williams. I'm a retired biologist here in Hamilton, uh, an ecologist uh, who functions a lot as a naturalist these days, <laughs> looking at nature. So the first thing I'm supposed to, because the Zoom camera is over here, I'm supposed to be a little more here than wandering, but I will wander a bit too. So the first thing to say is, can I get the slide moving? Um, I was going by the button here. Yep, okay, we got it. All right, so a spring. What are, when you think of spring, what are you thinking of? What tells you spring is here? And what I've shown here first on the left are things that many of us see coming up in our gardens. These are non-native things, garden things, and that's how we're first noticing spring. I used to put up a list outside my office door and ask people, what signs of spring are you seeing? Here's the list I used to get. It includes things like robins and geese and students in shorts and frisbees and so forth. These are all signs of spring. And if you are fans of Gary Larson, I included the cartoon, whether you're fans of slugs or not. But anyway, it is, uh, as has been described by others, a symphony of renewal. There's a lot going on. Now, I'm going to tell you about most of my observations, which really are largely in two places near here. One is Root Glen, which many of you are familiar with, and the other is the Kirkland Trail. And I will point out just that we're here, Root Glen is on campus, Kirkland Trail is a couple miles south, where there's a three mile stretch of trail that connects to another two and a half miles of an adjacent town. And I'm going to be looking at local patterns, birds, wildflowers, a little bit on butterflies. And then at the end, we'll say some things about how, to, how it differs in the Adirondacks. So there'll be a little more about Adirondacks later on. All the photos are mine except for two. Okay, so what is the first sign of spring? Every year it's skunk cabbage. Skunk cabbage pops up very early. And I took this photo in Root Glen. And what I want you to notice, skunk cabbage has melted a hole in the snow. And it does that. Uh, through the energy stored in the roots, skunk cabbage produces heat for a couple of purposes. One, realize there are very few pollinators out early, and by generating heat, that is one attractant to pollinators. The other is that heat leads to volatilizing what scents there are, and that helps draw in pollinators. But it's really a pretty remarkable sight to see skunk cabbage melting a hole in the snow and it will do that. And skunk cabbage always is the very first native plant we see. Okay, so what are my signs of spring? These are the things I look for every year to see that spring has come. Red-winged blackbirds are very early arrivals. They will start appearing in February. It's Eastern Phoebes spend the winter in the Southern US and in Mexico. And they're one of our early returning birds. And you can hear their song, their sound, their vo vocalization. And it's a very good sign of spring. Oh, okay. They're saying, Phoebe, Phoebe. Say Phoebe. Another sign of spring, if the Phoebe will stop, is spring peepers are little frogs that uh, are found in wetland areas. And once it, spring is arriving, males sing continuously in a chorus. 
maybe. There we are. That is the spring peeper chorus. And listen for that in an evening once spring has arrived. By the way, Phoebes are back and spring peepers are peeping. Um, now, the next thing is, I think, to stop. The... <laughs> All right, now we'll go back. Good morning, the other Bob. sign of spring, that was the only way I could figure to stop the vocalizations, is the first butterfly. And the first butterfly is a little more iffy because these butterflies, and I'm, what I've shown here is a morning cloak, they overwinter as adults in the cracks of bark on trees or in outbuildings. They actually survive our New York winters. And if you get a really warm day in March, they, morning cloaks can come out and fly around. And so these are the signs of spring that I always think of, that I'm looking for. Now, an aside, we all know that June 21st is the longest day, December 21st is the shortest day. And you'll notice that in this horrid pink color is a very nice sun curve of day length, where at the shortest day, it's maybe nine hours of daylight, at the longest, over 15. I took temperatures, average daily temperatures for Utica and averaged them over 30 years to look at the temperature curve. And you get a very similar curve. It's another sine curve shown in the blue diamonds with a one month time lag. And that time lag should make sense. The earth has great heat capacity and the warmth comes from the sun and solar radiation, but it takes a while to warm the earth up. It also takes a while for the earth to cool off. So we get, this is an empirically derived curve just based on the temperatures that you can get uh, from the Utica area and uh, with a one month timeline, which is to say spring is happening now. Days are longer, but it's actually still warming up rapidly. The days are longer than you would, or the temperature hasn't caught up to day length yet. That's one aside. So now if we're looking at those signs of spring. When are they appearing? And I, for a number of years, I've kept track of when I was first hearing. So Phoebe's okay. almost always. Earlier. Almost always, Phoebe's are appearing the end of March, the 1st of April. Hurt. Wow. Ditto with spring peepers. Uh, not every year, but this is about when it happens. Uh, first butterfly is much more variable because it depends on the day's temperature in that they can come out. And it's not necessarily always a morning cloak. These are relatives of morning cloaks, the Compton tortoiseshell and the Eastern comma. And they also overwinter as adults, among the few butterflies that overwinter as adults here. And they'll come out on a warm, sunny day. So uh, then other signs of spring, flowering lilacs, the return of rose-breasted rose grosbeaks, not yet, that's still coming. Another sign, just to point out, is when our goldfinches are turning golden, which they are now. Um, that is another sign that we're moving into spring. Well, of course, many people keep track of signs of spring. This was in the New York Times a month ago. A columnist, uh, Margaret Grankel, reported her signs of spring, and she's in Tennessee. With the flowering of spring beauties, Woodpecker drumming, red maple butters. This is spring beauties. We have spring beauties around here, and it's a wonderful native spring wildflower. Uh, but I don't have my own records. It depends on what I've been able to see consistently over time. Well, everybody is looking out for what's happening in spring. The figure on the left is from New York State. New York State now has a website that they're putting up what's happening across the state, what's in flower. It's a little hard to follow, but they're trying to show what's happening across the state. The figure on the right was the cover of the New Yorker that came yesterday, showing buds and birds and so forth. These are the signs of spring that we're all thinking of. Okay, so spring has happened. These are the early spring flowers. This is what 
one expects to find. And these shots are all from the Kirkland Trail. Um, and you can find the same things in Root Glen. Uh, the very first, always the skunk cabbage. The second is hepatica, and this is sharp lobed hepatica, which is in full flower in the Kirkland Trail right now, and it's a magnificent display right now. Uh, followed quickly by our trillium, the white or large flower trillium, red trillium, uh, trout lily, uh, blue cohosh is less spectacular, but it's in just opening up right now. These other plants are just opening now. Notice that our spring wildflowers, which are on the forest floor, open before the canopy because the canopy is then blocking light and uh, pollinators are more attracted while it is still light and uh, open so that we see this flush of spring ephemerals in, uh, under the, uh, in the forest floor before the canopy opens up. Um, now, not only are the wildflowers opening up, birds are coming in. And what I've highlighted here are warblers, in that warblers are neotropical migrants that come back, are colorful, have distinctive songs, and these four are always around here. Uh, every May and early June, I can count on finding these. And I will add that the male common yellow throat to me always was the bird of the pandemic because it always wears a mask. <laughs> and the singing of birds in the morning is often described as the dawn chorus. And there are many voices in that chorus. And so it always strikes me, this really is the symphony of spring to go out and listen to that. All right, now, conditions are changing. Climate change is real, it's happening. Here are measurements I've accumulated, again, Utica temperatures. And all I want you to point, all I want you to see, the most recent curve, which is the red one, summers are a little warmer, winters are a little warmer, the growing season is a little longer. Spring happens a little early. And so some of the changes, the timing that we're seeing of things, the appearance of things in the spring may be changing um, along with uh, multiple changes that are happening with climate change. And so also I have to say, not just from these data, but from other data, what's happening with climate change is that Nights are warming up more than days. Winter is warming up more than summer. And, uh, and the long-term effects of that, we don't yet know fully. All right, what about changing signs of spring around here? Well, first I have to say, I plotted all my records of TVs and spring peepers. And I cannot find a trend because there is too much variability in the data. So maybe in a longer term, some trend would come out, but we don't see a trend there yet, where when there is that much variability year to year. Others have been looking elsewhere. The table on the right, which was published 20 years ago, looked at 90 years change in the emergence and calling of different frogs, different amphibians. And over a 90 year period, there's quite been quite an advance. This is around Ithaca. Um, I added up here a little bit, uh, some of the timing of other things and certainly Massachusetts and Albany and Clinton are different locations where local conditions have an effect. But I'll just add one of the really interesting things in looking at climate change, the effect, the response of living organisms to climate change is that Thoreau kept pretty accurate records of what was flowering. And there are people from Boston University who've been drawing on Thoreau's records and comparing mid 1800s timing to timing now and seeing the effects of uh, climate change. Okay. Well, everybody, a lot of people are following things. Kurt Steger at Paul Smith's College in Northern New York has 
been following the return of robins. And many people think robins coming back, that's a good sign of spring. But of course, we have a few robins who are here all winter. I find it a little harder to use robins as an indicator because we do have robins around all winter, not many. But what Steger and others are trying to look at is waves of robins. There are more robins that come back. And if we, and I might go out and find three robins on a winter day, but then if 15 robins come through, then it's a little more conspicuous. Then we're getting a wave. So there are waves of robins that do come in, and that is another indicator of what's happening. Okay, now I want you to know about one of my favorite websites. It is called Journey North. And Journey North is uh, one of these citizen science or community science um, activities where people simply go online and report when they've seen something. And their Journey North has a whole series of things that it keeps track of, this and more. This is from one of the pages, one of the main pages of Journey North. But what I'm showing you here is, again, by color of the dots, lighter color is early, darker color is later. This is the current map of red-winged blackbirds. Well, we know they were here. They've been here early. They've been here since February. And so all the dots are really light. Well, how about ruby-throated hummingbirds? They're not here yet. These are the current maps from Journey North that I pulled out yesterday. This is the current reporting of hummingbirds. So they're on the way. They're not here yet. Uh, anyway, from Journey North, you can keep track. You can compare different things and see when hummingbirds are first getting up here. All right. Now, once we get into May, there's a lot happening. These, I took all these photos of wildflowers at root gland of wildflowers and non-native flowers um, in May 2nd in root glen. And so one bit of advice I would say, and this is wildflowers on the left and more a mix uh, with more non-natives on the right, but there are many things that come in flower and people ask me, when, when should you go to Rue Glen? Well, you can go to Rue Glen anytime to enjoy what's there. But I would say May 1st is a prime time for going to Rue Glen. And that's coming up in two weeks, a couple of weeks. So this is all from right in Root Glen. But I want to point out, as long as we're talking about Root Glen, I want to point out two particular plants in Root Glen because they are New York State threatened, officially threatened plants. Uh, one of them is called Twin Leaf. And the name Jeffersonia diphylla, Jeffersonia, it's named after Thomas Jefferson. Diphylla, you can sort of figure out by the common name and what the leaf looks like. It is a twin leaf. It is called twin leaf. This is a spectacular plant that flowers for about one day and disappears quickly. It's always in April, later part of April. And for those of you who knew Patsy Cooper, this was her favorite flower. And I used to keep an eye on it in Root Glen and try to let her know when twin leaf was coming up. The other plant that I've shown here, it, really, it's not to do with spraying, it's there all the time, is this heart's tongue fern. But it is a listed plant for New York State, and it is in Root Glen. So I want you to understand that there are some special plants, some special things in Root Glen. All right. Well, we're in spring. That means things are happening. And with birds around, we see signs of reproduction, signs of breeding, signs of nesting. You can start finding birds on nests, as with this vireo or hummingbird, or oftentimes you see birds carrying food. And if you see them carrying food, it means they're feeding young in the nest. And so this is one of the things that we keep track of as to what's happening with the breeding of birds. So it's not just seeing them, but seeing their activity uh, helps uh, Tell, can tell you a lot. All right. No, you're not being tested on what you can see on this slide. 
This is my record of the appearance of birds through the season where I go out for morning, long morning walks and keep track of things. So we're looking across the season at the top at different bird species when I've heard them. And here, for example, Phoebe's March. Phoebe's start coming in in March. Warblers, first of May, warblers are coming in. So this is just a way of keeping track of what's here all the time compared to what's coming in uh, through spring migration. And all of this, uh, we use the word phenology a lot. Phenology, it's the timing of these like life cycle events. It's the appearance, the timing through the season when things were appearing. Uh, so these are phenological records. All right, so if we accumulate some of that data, what do we find? For birds, and this is all data from the Kirkland Trail, that the number of species of birds really peak in May. And all of this is what I'm seeing when I go out for walks. Um, so it's a sampling of what's there. It's just my sample. Uh, the total number of birds, total number of species is peaking in May. Total number of birds is also peaking about the time. Well, notice the counts go down over the summer. Actually, the birds aren't going down, but they're less obvious. Um, and so I see and record them less, but certainly by species numbers, it's peaking in May because we're getting some migrants come through that are staying and some migrants that are continuing and going farther up north. All right, summer birds. Well, some of these are here year round such as cardinals and goldfinches we have all the time. But I put this together just to say that there is real beauty in some of these birds. Look at the colors of these birds. These are summer birds you can count on finding. They're here, and again, uh, these photos are all from the Kirkland Trail. Um, these birds are here in the summer. All right, what about, well, what about flowers in the summer? And here, uh, I'm going to show you two sets of flowers that are coming out in the summer. Two sets because, and even these are only samples. There's so many things that are coming out in flower uh, in the summertime, including many composites like the cone, cone flower, bee pollinated plants like jewelweed, um, many others. That's one set. Here's another set. These are just midsummer flowers that you can find um, with much happening. And I could say more about each, but I'll just say there's diversity in form and color. Uh, and that diversity of form and color is really peaking in the summer. If you want, I have put this together just to say there are lots of yellow flowers. Well, there sure are. Again, different shapes, but there are lots of yellow flowers. You will recognize some of these from uh, goldenrods to sunflowers to evening primrose, uh, marsh marigold, and so forth. Many different um, yellow flowers, especially. And we'll say a little bit more about that in a bit. But I do want to point out, many of these are non-native. This collection of photos here is all of non-native species. And um, one point to keep in mind is that where, there, where the local native vegetation is disturbed, that's where non-natives come in. That means roads and trails. Road edges, trail edges are places, especially for finding non-native plants. And non-natives are generally shade intolerant. Uh, meaning that they don't grow under the forest canopy. They're growing in more open areas. So disturbed sites, they also spread. They spread along trails. In fact, some non-native plants have been tracked, have been measured by the distance people are walking through a trail in an undisturbed forest and where you can find the non-natives. Some of these non-natives people like a lot, like Dame's Rocket, they may not think of Dane's rocket as a non-native, but it is an invasive non-native. Uh, 
People confuse Dame's Rocket with Phlox. Superficially, it's a lot like Phlox, but Dame's Rocket is in the mustard family and has four petals. Phlox has five petals. And if you look closely, you see that among some other differences. Queen Anne's Lace is wild care. And it, of course, grows around roadsides. Burdock, a bit of a problem. Uh, another non-native, all of these non-natives. Japanese honeysuckle, wild parsnip. Uh, one must beware a little bit of wild parsnip in that there's, uh, there are chemicals in the sap of wild parsnip that if spread on your skin and exposed to ultraviolet light will cause a rash and that it does interact with uh, skin DNA and will cause a rash. So these are all, these are all non-natives. Notice there's a non-native butterfly right there. Cabbage white is a non-native butterfly, known in Europe as a small white. So we're looking at the total array of things that are in flower, and people will ask, well, what makes it a native? Generally, it's a native if it was here before we got here. And we don't really know how and when things got here. <laughs> Meanwhile, some plants that are non-native have become pretty well integrated into our, uh, with the native plants in the natural communities that we find around, and they're less problematic. There are some very problematic non-natives, invasive non-natives, but not all are as noxious as things like spotted knapweed or Japanese knotweed, um, which are really problematic. Okay, so another slide, not for you to focus on details, but just to say I do the same thing as I did with birds with what's in flower. So looking across the top, these are dates through the summer. Here's a list of plants that are in flower, and I keep track of whether the flowering is beginning, full, or ending. And that's the BFE code. Well, what's the first plant list? Might not surprise you, it's some cabbage. That's the first thing that's coming out and flowering. So, and by the way, this is just page one of multiple pages. Uh, we're up to nearly 300 plant species that have been flowering along the trail. Okay, so how about flowering diversity over the summer? Flowering diversity really peaks later because uh, that is late July into early August, because we're getting a mix of things that flower early, as well as things that flower for a long time, and things that flower late. So if you're trying to look for the most species you can find in flower, try the end of July, and you'll find a lot. So these are patterns that we're seeing in the appearance of uh, organisms along the trail. Now, of course, the plants are there all the time. This is flowers. This is how many things are in flower. Okay, so I've said some things about birds and some things about flowers. I need to say a little bit about butterflies. I think a lot of people would imagine just, well, we can talk about the, the appearance of migratory birds coming in. We know there's a pattern in which they're arriving with, for example, warblers in March, I mean, uh, warblers in May, um, and may think that butterflies all emerge all at the same time. They don't. And the appearance of butterflies is much related to the, si the stage of their life cycle at which they overwinter. So the first butterflies we'll see every year are those that no surprise, overwinter as adults. Hence, a morning cloak with an A. It overwinters as an adult. Morning cloak and its relatives, commas and question marks and Compton's tortoise shell. The next butterflies that we're going to see are those that overwinter as pupae, because then as pupae, they can be closed from the pupal case. And we get things like cabbage white, sulfurs, even the swallowtails will be coming out on the earlier side. Then it's the things that are overwintering as larvae, as caterpillars. 
And if they're overwintering as caterpillars, they're still doing some feeding in the spring before they pupate and eclose. And the prime example to me of that is this one called a pearl crescent. So it overwinters as a caterpillar. And I'm pointing out the pearl crescent because it is the most widespread butterfly in the state of New York. I wouldn't call it the most abundant, but it is the most widespread. And you can find it fields everywhere. It's host plant or asters. And so there are many asters, many places, and there are pearl crescents, many places. But things like pearl crescent or the eastern tail blue, we see not as early appearing as some of these others that are overwintering as in the pupil stage. So there are whole patterns that, that one can find with the appearance of butterflies as well. But of course, the butterfly most people know about, if they know anything at all about butterflies, is a monarch. And I could tell you a lot about monarchs. I will just tell you a little bit. Monarchs migrate because they are descended from a tropical species. They cannot tolerate our winters. And so their strategy is to leave. And then they come back. And why do they come back? Because there's a great abundance of their host plant that they lay their eggs on, milkweeds, up in northern latitudes. Now, one can imagine the evolution of this migratory phenomenon through glaciation, when at the height of glaciation, milk, everything was at low latitudes. But as glaciers receded and milkweeds moved up in latitude, it benefited monarchs uh, to follow them which is to say, if you put it in terms of natural selection, say you've got two monarchs, A and B. Let's say A stays in Mexico um, and uses what milkweeds it can find, but B flies a little farther north where there are many more milkweeds and it lays many more eggs and has many more offspring. Well, over time, the B strategy is going to win out and the monarchs have evolved this migratory behavior. Well, going back to journey north, here, look at the patterns of, this is from a few years ago. Again, the dark, darker the dot, the more monarchs are being seen. This is through the spring migration, through a full spring migration. And I included that because we're only at the beginning of migration now. This is the current journey north map for monarchs. And a few monarchs are getting up here, but, uh, uh, some of these reports may not be entirely reliable. It's by the volume of information, the volume of reports that we really understand uh, what's their appearance. So this is the current map for monarchs. I included last fall's southward migration just to show you how Journey North and the data from citizens seeing and reporting online their observations this was last fall's southward migration of monarchs. The darker the dot, the later it is, as the seasonal code shows here. And so our monarchs will be leaving here in August, aimed for largely Mexico, though some of them end up in South Florida around Miami. Um, if we see a monarch, a live monarch in October, it ain't gonna make it. Uh, and we do sometimes see live monarchs in October, uh, but they're they're not going to uh, successfully make it. Their migration has to have uh, begun. Now, one factor that's really affecting monarchs is climate change. And I just put this in so you can see, this is the drought index for North America put out by NOAA. And there are some major areas of drought. And what really hits monarchs is that they have to fuel up for their southward migration. They have to visit flowers, get nectar. And the more drought there is down through this southern part of uh, their migratory route, the more problematic it is. Uh, so drought is also part of climate change. Now, a little bit of a transition to say a few things about pollinators and the appearance of the flowers that we have. 
These two photos are from a Rocky Mountain meadow. But they illustrate an important point. This meadow is an early, early meadow. And it is with buttercups and uh, uh, globe flowers, some related um, buttercup family plants, because the only pollinators that are around are flies, and they don't see color. You don't, there is no value to color when there are no color seeing insects around. So early season meadows are whites and yellows with flies as predominant pollinators. But as you move into later season, this is mid season. Look at that for a riot of color and shape because there's great diversity of pollinators available at that time. And so we're seeing diversity in color and form uh, as well as diverse with the pollinators. And I include all this because it pertains very much if you're going out to look at what is in flower. Sometimes you don't need to peg a name onto a flower to try to figure out something about its biology and what's pollinating it. And so there's a whole set of what are called pollination syndromes. And for example, if I say, if we look at some plants whose flowers are purple, low to the ground, and have a bad smell, you know what kind of insect is pollinating? That's flies or beetles or carrion insects. <laughs> if you find flowers that are largely red and tubular, that is particularly attractive to hummingbirds. They go to other things too. This is not a precise separation, but it's what's most attractive. And that's why hummingbird feeders are usually red. It's that's appealing to hummingbirds. Bees are very strong insects, and they will go to uh, flowers that are tubular and pointing out to the side. They can force their way into uh, flowers that some other pollinators cannot. Butterflies, like landing platforms, uh, composites are very good nectar sources for butterflies including things like coneflower and sunflowers. Not only is it, do these flowers provide a landing platform, but they've got many very narrow tubes with nectar and the proboscis of a butterfly can easily and readily extract nectar from all those small, uh, small corollas. All right, so now we get to late season. Now we're moving into August and September. And there are two groups of plants in flower in August and September that characterize late summer to me and are wonderful. The first are asters. These are all asters. These are right around here. The aster most people recognize is New England aster because it has this really nice purple, blue purple flower that you find in fields. New England aster stands out. But these other asters are asters are a really nice group of plants. And some you can recognize quite con conspicuously. How about heart leaf aster? That's more of a woodland aster, not a field. Some of these are field plants, some of them are more woodland plants. And so if asters are one group, what do you think the other common group of late season plants would be? How about Goldenrods. There are a lot of asters, there are a lot of goldenrods. And there's several very large species of goldenrods that are very hard to distinguish. Canada, tall, um, and the three species, and there is some hybridization. So it's not always easy to distinguish all of those, but some of the other goldenrods, uh, like blue stem uh, goldenrod, and sharp-leaved are more delicate plants that we do find around. And so goldenrods are interesting as well. Now, I said I'd take you briefly to the Adirondacks, just for a few comments about how things differ, how some seasonal things differ from here, our local area, to the Adirondacks. And so while we've been in the Clinton area, Rootland and, and um, the Kirkland Trail, Jumping now to the Western Adirondacks around uh, Twitchell Lake uh, and where we find many similar things, but it's a little different. 
First of all, the elevation around Clinton is roughly 600 feet. Around Twitchell Lake, it's over 2,000 feet. By being higher, it's cooler. On average, it's four degrees Fahrenheit cooler. Leaf out a week later. The growing season, two weeks shorter. It's a forested habitat, mostly forested habitat. Not much disturbance. There are some a few roads and trails, but not nearly the same extent of disturbance. Therefore, there are many fewer non-native plants compared to native plants. Those are differences that one finds readily. Now, um, in a book on the Adirondack floor, Michael Kudish gave these median emergence times. These are not first appearance. This is median emergence. And it all is a little bit later. Some of these are the same. There are a few plants that are the same, but there are some different plants. And I will, uh, we'll get to the plants in a moment, but there are also more birds. There are more warblers that are breeding in Adirondack forests than are breeding down here. Now, of course, things like common yellowthroat and red start, I've already said, are here. And they're up in the Adirondacks as well. But in the Adirondacks, we're regularly finding things like black-throated blue, magnolia, northern perula. They're all breeding there. And so there's a greater array of breeding warblers. The timing is not too different other than the fact that they're migrating through Clinton before they can get to the Adirondacks. Um, there are some different forest floor of spring ephemerals, like gold thread and this dewdrop and the Adirondack trillium, which you don't find down here, painted trillium, really wonderful plant. The other plants, there's a lot of water in the Adirondacks, and the other two plants that are included here are more in wet areas, uh, maybe lake or stream edges. And around those lake or stream edges, there are more other plants uh, as well. There are also a lot of orchids. There are more orchids in the Adirondacks than down here. These are all orchids that one can find. And I'm going to highlight one of them because it might surprise some of you a little bit. This middle one, Helberine, is a non-native orchid. That is an invasive orchid. I don't tend to think of orchids as invasive, but that is a non-native orchid. And it also does pretty well in forested habitats. But all these other orchids, one finds, you can find um, uh, Pink Lady Slipper in the Rome Sand Plains, for example and find some of these more around here. But these are plants that we clearly are finding in the Adirondacks. Um, this is a total aside. The Adirondacks, yeah, we're looking for loons. And there's the timing of loons where we can watch them nest, watch the chicks hatch, and watch the growth of the chicks until they leave. Loons are arriving now. They won't leave until early October. All right, so we're near the end here. Um, I know about how long an audience can stand to talk, <laughs> uh, which is probably correlated with how long a speaker can stand speaking. Um, but I want to end with a couple of things. And one, especially because this is a mostly Hamilton audience. Uh, John Nichols, uh, Hamilton <clears throat> class of, oh shoot, class of 64 or so, I think. Um, is best known for his fiction, uh, The Sterile Cuckoo, uh, Milagro, Beanfield War. But I want to point out, he wrote many, he was an avid naturalist. And John and I corresponded for many years uh, and shared photos and so forth. And one of his books, one of his, well, these are books, his books on, my, on our bookshelf. Um, my Heart Belongs to Nature, and that very much typified John. He was an avid, knowledgeable naturalist. These photos are when we, Sharon and I, went and visited him in uh, New Mexico. Um, and he died last September. So anyway, I think of this book title a lot in that a lot of what I do is very much focused on the beauty and diversity of nature. 
and I do a lot of nature photography and write these updates and my book on observations in nature is all tuned into this, the beauty and diversity of nature. And you will find that when you go out and look on your own. So I will end just with this. These flowers photos are from two days ago. <clears throat> this is hepatica that is growing. These photos are from the Kirkland Trail. This is witch hazel. This is from Root Glen in flower now. This is not a flower, but I want to point out this butterfly, a red admiral. Uh, you may not remember, but 12 years ago in 2012, there was an explosion of red admirals nationwide. Their food plant, their host plant are, this are uh, nettles, nettles. And in 2012, every time you found a nettle patch, you found caterpillars of red admirals. Well, I want you to know all the signs are right now, we're in the next big explosion of red admirals. So keep an eye out for them. Uh, they're already being reported that come into New York State, they're coming. And it's an okay thing to have come and have lots of red admirals and let them eat all the nettles they want. Um, so red admirals are coming. And I think I will just stop there and say that I'm happy to uh, entertain some questions. Yes. I, I like to keep track of things myself. So I, I was wondering when you're out on your walks, how are you keeping track of species and total number of birds, for example? How do you do that? Um, well, uh, many birds here know about eBird. Okay. And that you can keep track that way. Actually, I find it easier for me. I have a piece of paper and a pen. Okay. <laughs> and when I see the species, I write it down. Every time I think I'm finding a new bird, I put a check mark. At the end of my walk, I go in and on eBird. Okay. But at, people who are reporting birds can do it the way that's most convenient for them, what's comfortable for them, or what's comfortable for me is writing it down. And I, I'm balancing binoculars and camera and so forth. But I was just trying to picture how you are on your morning walk yeah. trying to you know, record all the, all the things you're seeing. Um, uh, but it's fun. I mean, there's no rush. rush. Sure. You're out there walking. Uh, it's not a power. <laughs> yeah. Bob. Talked about climate change, making earlier arrivals for various things. Do you know whether it's messing up synchronization? Yes. Oh, there are reports. That's been there's a lot of research now on the loss of synchronization, that which is to say insect feeding birds like warblers that are looking for caterpillars. Maybe the caterpillar, maybe birds are getting here, but the caterpillars aren't out yet. It's mistime. There is mistiming that is taking place. And so actually that is something that a lot of uh, a lot of people are looking at now and to see what effect there will be from that lack of synchronization. Yes. Uh, related to that question that I was reading about how some birds uh, use a light and others temperature. And because temperature is a bigger variable these days, I'm wondering if those creatures that rely on light changes will tend to uh, survive better than the heat. Right. Um, clues, environmental clue. You're you're right about environmental clues being light and temperature. And you're right, of course, that light is a reliable cue. Temperature is not so reliable a cue. So that. Most birds, they're using light. They're not using temperature or temperature to a very second, secondary degree. And that my, all migratory things, butterflies as well, monarchs as well as birds, make use of wind patterns going in the direction they want to go. And if it's the weather isn't right, you don't keep migrating. Um, I, I would say that the... It is light, it is photo period. It is photo period that really drives most of these seasonal timing. 
Uh, and temperature is really a far place second, I would say. So I don't think there's, um, well, th uh, because of uh, warmth, it is accelerating some things more than other things, because in fact, I'm, what you have me thinking through, if birds are relying on the photo period, the photo period is a change. But plants are relying more on temperature, and temperature is changing. So you're getting more of a disconnect there. Uh, and so that's part of the lack of synchronization. But a lot of work is going on, people looking at that now. Yes? Protect our overwintering insects. Is it true we should keep our stems in the garden and our and not be cleaning up, cleaning up our there is a, first of all, lawns are biologically stacked. And people have lots of lawns because they find it very open and attractive to green. And some lawns, well, I, mean, I want some, some lawns, but I want only a little bit. So I want more field. And what you're talking about really is uh, leaving mulch. Uh, their recommendations of uh, don't rake up all leaves and get rid of all leaves because, in fact, mulch does create some overwintering habitat uh, for insects. I, I, again, it's not all or nothing. It's, yeah, we rake some leaves, we get rid of leaves in some places, but there are places I want to leave leaves. That's all. So you're touching on something that actually. Uh, uh, people are writing and talking about it. Another is there's, uh, you may have heard uh, some people pushing a no mo may. Have you heard of that? No mo may. Don't mow in the month of May. Um, the grass will get tall, but one of the things that not mowing in May does is allow things like milkweeds to grow taller and be ever more attractive to. Uh, Monarchs. And actually, some research that I've, a couple of studies I've published looked at the timing of mowing of fields on monarchs. And monarchs, as you know, lay their eggs on milkweeds. But old senescent milkweeds are less attractive than young regrowing milkweeds. So that you can mow a field with milkweeds through June, and the milkweeds will regrow. And then you've got more attractive stems uh, for overpositing peanuts. And then don't mow when the caterpillars are around the lap from July and August, and then mow again in September when the adults are leaving. Now that's for feeds. That's not for the lawns. Um, so a, a lot of this is being aware that nature is a little messy. That is mulch and diverse arrays of plants and so forth adds, uh, and I adds to survivability. I will add quickly that even that mowing, mowing in July, if I owned a large patch, uh, a meadow, I'd mow part of it in June, but I wouldn't mow the whole thing. That is, keep some diverse habitat, some diversity in habitat and diversity in the different stages of plants. Yes, Mary. Hi, uh, I wanted to ask about the jungle, which the last few years we've been seeing more of, and uh, they, they quite, there's quite scolding when you get around them. Is that a native or a non-native? Juncos are native. Are the juncos are here year round. Um, uh, you can see juncos all winter. Um, so you had no picture of a jungle. Oh, well, I do, but it's way. <laughs> it would take too long to dig it up. Um, um, we are seeing some birds more than used to be the case. Uh, cardinals are more abundant than they used to be. Um, a bird I'm, that is spreading northward is a red-headed woodpecker. Not red belly. Most of you are probably thinking of what's a red belly, but a real red headed woodpecker. That's not a pileated either, but a red headed woodpecker 
is a more southern bird that really is moving northward. Um, and some, it's sometimes seen in Western Europe. Have you ever seen one, you birders? You I have in Silver Beach. Uh, Silver Beach. Right the yeah. That's an example of them being more abundant farther north than used to be. So their change, ranges are changing. Sure, we talk about the, the life cycle of the monarchs in this area as with when things are happening. Sure. What, what things happen when? Uh, life cycle of monarchs in this area. Uh, the monarchs uh, that left here, and I'll try to, try to do this brief. The monarchs that left here in September, if they survived, made it to the mountains of western Mexico City, or some of them might have gone to Miami. Those that oh, survived the winter on the mountains of western Mexico City start migrating northward in February and March. They lay eggs in Texas and southern states, and they die. The ones that overwintered mostly die. It's rare for them to get much farther. It's their offspring that come out and make it up to western New York. But generally, in our central New York and the Adirondacks, we don't even see that generation. It isn't until they reproduce, their offspring start spreading and filling out empty habitat. We don't call that migration. It's not migration. Migration came from those that were coming from Texas and the southern states. But as they're breeding, breeding and the population size is growing, they spread out the building. And so we might get a couple more generations during the summer. But then in August, as and this has been shown, uh, there's a sun effect. When the sun, when the peak of the sun has decreased to a certain uh, degree level, that spurs monarchs to start becoming migratory. And when they leave here in August, um, they are they're, uh, hormonally stop reproducing. All energy is into flight, but a full, uh, a monarch that leaves here might weigh 250 grams. That's a quarter of a gram. But a full fed monarch weighs double. Africa. And by the time they get to the overwintering grounds, they need to be feeding heavily on nectar and to be building up their fat supplies. It's the fact there isn't much nectar during the year. And so they live off the limited supplies that they build up. And that's why uh, overwintering, the overwintering monarchs are actually high on the mountain. They're, they're high and it's cold. I spent eight hours standing in one place, 40 degrees, watching monarchs on tape. It's not, that's cold. You have to stay in one place at 40 degrees. And they're cool to minimize the burning up of their lipid fuel during the winter. Um, so the life cycle of monarchs. Basically, we see them leave here in August, September, and September. A lot of leaving in We see them coming back. I would say June for Western New York, maybe June for Central New York. For Adirondacks, it's really not until July or the end of June. Do they have multiple generations up here, or do they can? It depends. Those uh, a generation is six weeks. So if we see one, we could get a couple generations. So that, that uh, six weeks, that from egg being laid to uh, an adult surviving. Though the overwintering months survive for nine months, but there's some come on, so six weeks. You see any noticeable changes with the loss of pastures? Noticeable changes from the loss of ash trees uh, to the best of my, I don't, I, I can't say, I don't know. Um, the loss of ash, what that would tell me is uh, there is a pretty uh, widespread decline in the insect. And if you're losing ash trees, you're losing things like moth caterpillars that feed on ash. And so I 
and ensure that the loss of the decline of ash would lead to the loss of species that are ash feeders. And so there would be some effect largely on, on some moths and other insects. Um, but that's, I think, as much as I can that I know. Effect on the other story? Is there a big effect on the other story? Um, effect on the understory. Of course, there are other trees that can grow. And if you look historically over 12,000 years, from 12,000 years ago, when there was no forest because it was all ice, to then the composition of the forest has changed over time. Also, if you look at the eastern deciduous forest 200 years ago, 30% of the trees were American chestnuts. Now, you go out and find an American chestnut now, you won't. Um, uh, beech and sugar maple are changing in abundance because of both climate change, sugar maple, the range is moving northward. Um, beech, there is an effect, there's a disease, beech bark disease that's affecting beech. Um, Hemlock will be adulterated. Hemlock uh, being hit by the spread northward of this insect called a woolly adelgid. Uh, so forests change over time. Uh, and knowing just what some of the effects are, I, there are lots of people looking at a lot of things. Anything else? Yes. You probably wouldn't want to photograph them, but this is a good sign of spring as the earthworms. So all of our drop in the And most of those are non named. That's what I was going to ask. They are non named. Most of them. Yeah, there is somebody on the Colgate faculty who's working for earthworms and has been has surveyed some places up here. Uh, and uh, almost all the earthworms you encounter. And that means the soil and nutrient composition of the soil is clean. So what did Robin eat before <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, The original Jurassic Park had in mind that I was stuck with nature will find a way. <laughs> and, you know, you've got a hungry bird, they'll find things that How did earthworms get here? Yeah. Well, there are native earthworms, but how did the non-native get here? Look at all the plants that are brought in, in, in soil and pots. Um, we have a number of native things, non-natives that have been brought in just unintentionally. Occasionally, there's something that's intentional. Uh, Gypsy moth was an intentional introduction by someone at Tufts University who thought that gypsy moth could spin silk and we'd have a whole new economy of silk. <laughs> and he left the window open and his jar blew over and they crawled out the window. And we've had gypsy moths in North America since, as they have spread. Um, so most of the non-native things that we have were unintentional, but there were some intentional. As you may know that starlings and house sparrows were introduced to the U.S. to have all the birds that Shakespeare wrote about, and so we have starlings and hustlers. Nature does change, and things adapt. We lose some things, we gain some. We're losing a lot. We're losing more than sure. As Europeans traveled and colonized various areas. They wanted many of their their garden plants that they that they were used to back in Europe, and they brought them over. And I'm sure they brought you know worms and insects and so forth with them. Yeah, um, I I think we should stop there. Thank you. We've gone about as long as I think we should. So, uh, so just keep your eyes open. Okay, friend.